From the studios of Nationwide Radio, morning radio the right way. It's Nationwide this morning. Tana Thomas coming up in the news at 6 for this morning, Tuesday, November 3, 2020. D-Day in the U.S. Almost 100 million Americans have voted already in what will be one of the most consequential presidential elections in the history of the United States. In local news, with just a week before the launch of a pilot for face-to-face classes, at least one principal is alleging there has been no formal communication from the Education Ministry about his school being selected. The election Monitoring and Appeals Committee of the People's National Party has ruled that National Workers Union delegates will be allowed to vote in the party's presidential election on Saturday. In regional and international news this morning, Austrian police are searching for at least one suspect after a multiple gun attack in the capital, Vienna, that killed four people. In the sports report, sports report Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp says he has enjoyed watching Atalanta play on tape. And in business, this morning shop owners in cities across the u.s are boarding up windows as they brace for unrest following the u.s election the details coming up next if you can hear this you are connected for 20 years the spectrum management authority has been shaping the landscape of wireless technology in jamaica ensuring the provision of clean and clear radio frequencies across the island From home security to securing our borders, we are everywhere, regulating the digital landscape. The Spectrum Management Authority, shaping your future with wireless. Catch the first news of the day. A comprehensive package of local, international, sports and business news. The News at 6 on Nationwide 90 FM. to the details. Almost 100 million Americans have voted already in what will be one of the most consequential presidential elections in the history of the United States. The elections will climax today, the final day of voting to decide whether President Donald Trump will get a second term or his Democratic rival, former Vice President Joe Biden, will be elected the 46th president of the global superpower. Stephen Simmons reports. Last night, President Trump sprinted through four more battleground states. In North Carolina, he told supporters that next year will be the greatest economic year in the history of the U.S. In Grand Rapids, Michigan, he told supporters that he's confident that the U.S. will access a COVID-19 vaccine very quickly. We will mass distribute the vaccine in just a few short weeks. It will quickly eradicate the virus and wipe out the China plague once and for all. The Biden lockdown will mean no school, no graduations, no weddings, no Thanksgivings. Mr. Biden also went to Pennsylvania where he was joined by singer Lady Gaga at a rally in Pittsburgh. I'll put in action a plan I've been talking about for months. Masking, social distancing, testing, tracing, a plan for full and fair and free distribution of therapeutics and the vaccine when it comes. Imagine, imagine where we could be if a president only wore a mask from the beginning instead of mocked it. I can- President Trump has been quoted by international media as being critical of the counting so far. Mr. Biden, a former vice president, is considered the favorite to win. However, future leaders, representatives for the USA on the Jamaica Diaspora Advisory Board, David Mullins, says polls don't always get it right. If, if we focus on who is winning, and we're going to pay attention to the polls this time versus 2016, then it, it does say that you know, Vice President Joe Biden is winning. Uh, we need to be cautious about that again. We know that polls don't tell the whole story, and there are snapshots of time in terms of why people are so upset. I think that we've seen, unfortunately, the United States lose its status in terms of being a global leader, whether it is fighting climate change, whether it is leading trade, free trade, fair trade. It is a nation of immigrants, and it seems to have turned 
uh, to the opposite of that. So there are a number of people upset about that. Meanwhile, former General Counsel for the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, Colonel Will Gunn, says a large turnout is usually not in favor of the incumbent. But we certainly believe that with a large turnout, it is to the advantage of um, Joe, Joe Biden. Donald Trump has made it a priority to depress the vote. He's cast all types of uh, insinuations that the vote is rigged, that absentee voting is unfair. And so we have record turnout in terms of early voting. In some states, they have already surpassed the total amount of votes that were cast in 2016. So considering the national polls, considering the turnout thus far, I believe that that is very much in favor of Joe Biden. Both were speaking last evening on Nationwide at 5. Stevie Ann Simmons for Nationwide News. Back home with just a week before the launch of a pilot for face-to-face classes in 17 schools across nine parishes, at least one principal is alleging there's been no formal communication from the education ministry about his school being selected. Principal of Albert Town High School in Trelawney, Dwayne Edwards, says he's yet to formally hear about the limited reopening of his school. That at this, this is what we're at, November the 2nd. Mm-hmm. One week away. We, we so have not had those discussions, sir. We have not had those discussions. We would want to think that they are necessary discussions. I would want to think that they would have those discussions would have been had from as far back as two, three weeks ago. We were thinking about the ninth of November. But at the first of November I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that I was not contacted in any way or form. He says the news his school had been selected out for the pilot came as a surprise. Mr. Edwards says while they had systems in place for classes from as far back as October, there were, there were still concerns about face-to-face classes. We had the, the, the systems in place. However, the, 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 the variables, some variables are outside of our control. So we can always sanitize persons coming in. But for Lorne, as we know, it, it, it is interconnected with Manchester and all other parishes in, in Jamaica. So we do not believe the risk entailed in, in, in our children and our staff members coming to school um, with the possibility of having COVID-19. We cannot control that kind of a risk. No, uh, that's a great concern for us. The principal says no reinspection has been done since September when health ministry officials inspected and passed his school. Mr. Edwards says he learned his school would be among the 17 listed via the media and by way of a leaked education ministry letter on social media. As I said, we received a communique this afternoon speaking to a meeting to be had tomorrow, but that is as far as any form of communication from the ministry. And that, um, but hold on, I want, to, I want to be very clear. That communication came from the ministry in Kingston or from the regional... It was by of, the regional director. The regional director? Or the permanent secretary. Okay. Yes, it indicated that it would be a meeting with the permanent secretary and it would have invited the board chair and the principal of um, the principals of the school selected. And, and uh, where, where is this meeting to take place? It was an online, it was a virtual meeting, All right. but as I said, it has been rescheduled to, to Wednesday. Not sure of the time just yet. Dwayne Edwards, principal of Albert Town High in Trelawney, speaking last evening on Nationwide at 5 with Cliff Hughes and Tyrone Reed. Meanwhile, uncertainty is looming for the 17 schools proposed by the Education Ministry for the face-to-face pilot. State Minister in the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, Robert Morgan, says whether the schools named for the pilot resume classes next week will depend on approval from the Health Ministry. That is dependent on whether or not, in response to our query, the Ministry of Health says go ahead. And after the Ministry of Health says go ahead, and in our consultation with the principals, the principals say, yes, we can go. He also says the leaked letter referenced by Mr. Edwards short-circuited the ministry's due diligence process with the preemptive release of a list of the schools being proposed for the pilot. A letter, a formal letter was sent from our ministry to another ministry and someone in the midst 
of that process. I do not know which ministry it came from, decided that that letter should be released to the public. I have no knowledge of who that person is. I don't know if it is from the Ministry of Health. I do not know if it is from the Ministry of Education. So what that has done is that has sought, sought to do the process that was outlined by the Minister as the approach that we will be taking. The state minister says the letter was issued by the Ministry of Education seeking approval from the health ministry for the select low-risk schools. He says the letter was not for public consumption. However, he says the education ministry accepts the criticisms of being late in alerting the related education stakeholders ahead of the November 9 date. State Minister Morgan also says the process for approval of the 17 schools has not yet been done. But we're not going to be putting out the country in a position where we are known a school to be reopened and then a couple of days later we have to retract that announcement because that will may not fulfill the necessary COVID protocol. Mm-hmm. So the first step has to be to engage with the Ministry of Health to find out whether these schools that we identify as potentially able to be reopened fulfill all the requirements. We have not been able to complete that process up to today in order to have a meeting with these principals to say we have reviewed everything about your school we have looked at all the variables and your school qualifies as a school to be reopened Robert Morgan, State Minister for Education, Youth and Information speaking last evening on Nationwide at 5 The Election Monitoring and Appeals Committee of the People's National Party, PNP, has ruled that National Workers Union delegates will be allowed to vote in the party's presidential election on Saturday. Last week, Southeast St. Anne MP and PNP presidential candidate Lisa Hanna challenged the list of persons submitted by the NWU to be delegates to the party's conference on November 7. Ms. Hannah is going up against South St. Andrew MP Mark Golding in the contest to replace Dr. Peter Phillips as PNP president. The Election Monitoring and Appeals Committee says it expects that both camps will make no further public comment on the matter. Last week, our news center reported that in a complaint to the party's general secretary, Julian Robinson, Ms. Hannah's campaign manager, Donna Scott Motley, requested that the NWU be put to strict proof that list of delegates is reflected in filing, failing which she said the delegates should be disqualified from voting in the presidential election. In a statement to the media yesterday, the PNP Secretariat said after consultation and deliberation, it was determined that the NWU's failure to file certain statutory returns was not sufficient to disqualify the union from naming delegates. Chairman of the committee, Norman Minot, says though the committee had concerns, the party was not in a position to disqualify any individual named on the NWU delegates list. The committee also noted that the and a team also raised questions about whether the NWU failed to comply with its own structural framework for the selection of delegates. Mr. Minot says the Election Monitoring and Appeals Committee considered the objections raised by the Hannah camp as legitimate issues that warranted inquiry and consideration. Meanwhile, according to the statement issued by the PNP Secretariat yesterday, PNP Chairman Fitz Jackson commented that the committee's concerns related to issues surrounding the party's relationship with the NWU, he says, who is also Mr. Jackson, rather, who is also a member of the party's election monitoring and appeals committee, says the committee is recommending that the party take urgent action to implement the recommendations contained in the report of a board of inquiry established by the party. Party and sh- and chaired by Danny Roberts. In the meantime, the PNP's Election Monitoring and Appeals Committee chairman says it would not be making any further public statement on the matter and that all outstanding matters will be addressed internally. According to Mr. Minot, the committee expects that all parties will act in a similar manner by not making any further public comments on the matter. And that's it for the local segment of the news. Up next, regional and international.
In regional and international news this morning, regional news, Trinidad and Tobago has reported no new COVID-19 cases in the last 24 hours. According to the Ministry's Health Ministry of Health's daily 4 p.m. update yesterday, the category no, new positive cases was recorded at zero with no new deaths related to the virus. The Ministry's daily updates track the, the status of the virus in Trinidad to and Tobago since the first positive of cases the recorded on March 12. Act. TNT's total active COVID-19 cases now stands at 708 people, that was a total positive cases of since risk March at 5,704. There are currently 61 patients in the hospital and 617 people According in homes of self-isolation. Occupancy at state quarantine facilities is at 313 people, with 30 people now in step-down facilities. A total of 4,887 patients have been was reported as injured covered in several others of were whom were reported yesterday. There was an illegal With event, countries in uh, Europe and the Americas experiencing the second location, and third waves of COVID-19, the Barbados government will soon require all visitors to the island to arrive with negative PCR test results. That disclosure came from Prime Minister Mia Motley on Sunday night ahead of an announcement yesterday that 14 more countries will be added to the high-risk group effective today. Well an update to the COVID-19 travel protocols moved Antigua shot. and Barbuda, and Cayman Islands, Cuba, Estonia, that. Finland, Germany, SSB Ghana, Greece, also Iceland, urging Japan, the Martinique, Norway, Sri Lanka, and parties. the United Arab Emirates to, to the list of those deemed high risk for COVID-19, bringing the total in that category to 50. The other 36 include Barbados' major tourism markets, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada, as well as neighboring Jamaica, Guyana, and Trinidad and Tobago. Five countries are now deemed medium risk for entry, Australia, Bermuda, New Zealand, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent, and the Grenadines. Only Egypt and Greenland are in the low risk group, while Anguilla, China, Dominica, Grenada, Montserrat, and St. Kitts and Nevis are categorized as very low risk. Under the current protocols, all persons traveling to Barbados from high and medium risk countries must have a negative COVID-19 PCR test done at an accredited or certified facility within three days prior to arrival. Persons arriving from Canada are allowed to be tested on arrival in Barbados if they are unable to receive their test results in time for departure from their country. In international news, Australian related. police According are searching to for Chan, at least some one suspect after multiple gun cover attack to in the capital of Vienna that killed Stephen four people. Simmons reports. 17 other Minister people Chang are wounded, that some, some seriously, are after gunmen the opened fire at in six different locations in the city centre last evening. He says Officials say one attacker was shot in dead by the police. Interior Minister Carl Niehammer described the assailant killed by the police as an Islamist terrorist. He later told the APA news agency that the 20-year-old gunman had been released earlier from jail last December, eight months after he was convicted of trying to travel to Syria to join the militant Islamic State group IS. Charles Sebastian Kurz said it was clearly an attack driven by hatred of their way of life and their democracy. Two of those who died in the shooting were women and two were men. One of the women was reportedly a waitress. The second woman died of her wounds in hospital the overnight. Many the victims were in a city centre area busy with people in bars and restaurants near Vienna's central synagogue, but it's not yet clear if that was the target. And that's for regional and international. Up next is sports.